Hey guys, this is Kirob speaking and in today's little dev update we are going to talk about uh, stuff that has happened in the last uh, three or four weeks since the last little dev update which was about some development challenges and team restructuring. If you haven't watched that video it will be great for you to have as context for what I'm going to talk about right now and then we're just going to delve into new developments since then. Uh, let's give you a quick overview of that. So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of hiring and uh, the current team structure. And then we are jumping into some cool sandboxy stuff that has been developed. And then I'm going to show you some of the new market screen stuff that is now implemented. Still quite buggy, but implemented and showing where it's leading. And it's looking really nice uh, in terms of functionality, that is. And then... We're going to talk turbos and where that development has been going. And th that is going to be proper nerdy, spreadsheety. So I'm going to put that towards the end of the video. So first thing on the list was team structure and hiring. And yes, we have found someone for that junior programmer position. We are now finalizing that hiring process. And I can also tell you two other things that are good news. And that is that our cyclist lead developer, lead programmer is currently being onboarded uh, onto automation as well as our um, lead programmer, uh, the one where, who had health issues, has recovered quite nicely and is not to full capacity, but is back working on the game um, to a reasonable capacity that is helping us all out fixing some bottleneck issues. So this is all going pretty well. On another important note in that regard is that the cyclist lead developer, lead programmer, who has been moving over to automation, has left a little bit of a hole in the team. And I have requested that we do a little bit more of a restructuring there so that we do hire yet another person who is then going to help us out prototype game mechanics and uh, new game ideas and so on to have a proper prototyping team or pre-production team together with me. And that position is linked down in the description below. If that sounds like something that you would be interested in, please check it out. It will be a local position, so in Wellington, New Zealand, but a remote start would be possible. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at some juicy, juicy features, which I haven't been showing you for a long time. Uh, let's head over to the car designer and you're already going to see some <clears throat> weird stuff in there. Let's, let's start with this one. One thing, especially the beam NG drive players have been requesting a lot is a bit more freedom in terms of what you can do with your designs. And we'll see that this this car looks a little funky, doesn't it? Well, so Isaac has been working a lot on, uh, that is our UI program, has been working a lot on implementing cool shit. And <laughs> how about that cool shit? When you're on the fixture tab, you have now advanced trim settings, stuff that is only cosmetic, but will export to BeamNG. So the top setting is not only BeamNG, of course, but um, also enables you to, to hide things that you don't want to see, uh, window tint and transparency in, in general. That's uh, good stuff. But then we have that experimental section. And let me... Um, let me show you how experimental it is of a section. So let's take the engine, for instance, and you are going to see like... Um, ah, this does, still doesn't work. But uh, yeah, you're going to see that this is uh, a qu quite quite the thing. Uh, you can actually move around the engine. It's not going to be looking like it's functional. No worries. But <laughs> look, look at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh, certainly not how you want to design your car. But... It gives you all kinds of freedom to do whatever you like to do for BeamNG, if you have custom builds and so on. So for instance, we could just move the engine back a little because it's sticking out or not sticking out enough. And uh, also that goes for the Z position, of course. Uh, you can uh, mount your engine on the bonnet if you like to. Uh, might, might have uh, some eyes turning towards you. You can even rotate the engine. Oh, there you go. Slant engines possible. 
Well, not in calculation wise. These things are not changing any of the stats. They are just for you to be creative. And of course you can make it a little larger than it actually is because that looks like a very economical setup. Of course, that is not all. What you also can do, let's uh, try to get to the wheels, is change all kinds of wheel parameters. These wheels don't look like automation wheels, do they? Now, you can change um, the offset, you can change the width, and this is cosmetic only. Uh, wheel diameter, oh, look at that. You can uh, change the, the <laughs> where the rim sits, uh, brake offset, you know what that is. Uh, can adjust some camber. Um, what else can you do? Oh, 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 this one. Whoop. Oh, yeah, these look. Oh, yeah. Perfect. This looks exactly like I want to have my tires on the road for super economy driving, of course. Um, so, as you can see, we could, could, you can just do like crazy amounts of stuff but this is probably something that you are going to like the most or at least I think that's probably one of the things that is most anticipated you can change the curve on the tire so that you really can make some stancy stuff as well if you if you like to and how much it bulges and the lip on the on the tires there so you can make just whatever look you like really without of course changing the tread that is separate for front and rear tire, and then a suspension. Well, you can do all kinds of things, like um, slight right height adjustment uh, only for the back. Uh, yeah, that does export to <laughs> BMG. So I think we are going to see a lot of uh, slightly funky builds. Even the engine sound supposedly can be adjusted, and that of course would be uh, pretty cool as well. Um, but overall, this gives you a lot of creative design freedom for both photo scenes, presentation of cars and for your exports into BeamNG where these things actually do matter and influence driving and so on. So just to give you an idea of what you can do with this stuff, well, um, check, check out this one. You're seeing it in the thumbnail already. And there you go. Proper monster trucky car uh, with massive, <laughs> massive tires. Yeah. That is uh, now possible. And this one actually exports and drives in Beam and G Drive. So, um, fun times. Another example of this would be uh, this beauty. And how is this made, you ask? Well, we have added something that you will uh, love to see as well. Look at, look at that. This is actually a truck. Yeah. yeah you, see, you see it? Yes. The thing is that we have painted it with invisible paint. <laughs> so, uh, that is an option now. And that makes stuff disappear. And then, of course, the wheels were made with the wheel settings that we just talked about. And engine was moved around with the engine tools that you have. So, yeah, this is uh, all working and that should export nicely to Beam and G Drive. And you can actually do dragster racing in there uh, without making crazy modding efforts to get to the same place. One thing that you also see down here is how many more slots there are available now. Like we have one for the chassis, so you can actually hide the chassis if you're painting it in the in that appropriate color. You can also resize the chassis underneath. Uh, that is one of the options, of course. And overall, this is just, yeah, through the roof, new options for you who are like crazy in uh, BeamNG Drive. But now for you connoisseurs of proper automation gameplay, <laughs> Snob snobby campaigners, yes, not the filthy casuals that have an attention span of uh, minus one minute, i.e. BeamNG players, um, we are going to take a look at the new markets. And that we can just simply do by loading up a campaign save. And of course, yes, I'm joking. If that wasn't obvious, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, so we are going to take a look at the cars I've been preparing here. So I have a premium trim, a family trim and a convertible trim in here. We're going to see how that looks now on that markets tab that we have. If we just load in here and you can see that uh, yeah, the side panel is working as intended now. You can see the coloring as well as the um, opacity being what we talked about before. Not going to bore you much more with that. That is how good it is, like how desirable it is. And the opacity is how well its stats are matched towards that 
uh, desirability profile that this demographic has. You can see that here in the tooltip uh, on the lower right. It's the demographic desires that is basically what is being measured here. But so now, what does the uh, market stab look like? There you go. Well, that is looking proper. So you have a list. Well, not not quite. As you can see, there's <laughs> loads of placeholders in here. But um, what is going on here is that well, a stupid price is set. Uh, this isn't quite working yet. But um, in principle, you get the gist that you can see which trim is selling in which demographic. And those are colored according to your best trim's desirability in there. And then the size of the um, of the pie chart inside is how many you're selling compared to, or how much your market share is compared to the um, demographic as a whole. Um, and yeah, that might change to overall sales instead. But uh, yeah, it doesn't matter for now. But you can clearly see where your different trims are actually selling. Like in the family category, we are selling mostly the family trim. In the premium demographic, we are selling both the, the premium trim as well as the convertible trim. And I think overall this is giving you a much better idea of how your lineup is working for you. And something sneaky that we have been uh, discussing and are going to do is that this will be available in Sandbox. So the Markets tab in Sandbox will now function just like in Campaign so that when you are designing a car and you are one of those in big air quotes, <laughs> and I mean that, Pleb Beam and G players who don't fancy the, the, the savage mechanics of the proper cutthroaty campaign play, then uh, which isn't very cutthroaty at the moment because you can just cheat. But um, you will stumble across this and like, oh shit, yeah, there's actually a campaign game after uh, a tycoon game behind this. Isn't that cool? Um, so we hope that by combining the back end, we are providing something to the sandbox players, to the sandbox mainly players, to give them a little bit more of a flavor there, like, oh, what would it look like? How many cars of this would I be able to sell? We're going to give you a good idea with this kind of screen in sandbox as well. For those of you who are not interested, it is exactly the same way as it is before. You won't even see it. And with that, I mean, you won't probably go into the markets tab here. Uh, after you've designed a car. Anyway, um, how does this work in Sandbox, though? Why, well, in Sandbox, you have, you're, ma you're making individual cars. Not quite. You are making a model and you're making trims, and those trims that have the same design here can be considered a facelift. And then we are back to how it works in campaign. So we're going to just make that assumption that, okay, those. Uh, trims that are designed on the same year, they are part of the lineup um, for that model in that year. And when you go there, you will get the sales statistics for that very year. I think this is an excellent solution that is not in your face, but that gives sandbox players a bit of an opportunity to maybe to, to feel out what it would be like in campaign as this is a nice feedback um, to what they are doing in sandbox mode as well. And uh, for role players even more so. Uh, down here you get the overall sales statistics and this currently is still broken. I can set different prices here of course, but uh, somehow that doesn't seem to quite compute yet. So a little buggy, but um, overall already implemented. And now I believe it is time to talk about the two bros because uh, well, that's what you've been waiting for. No of the, none of the calculations in the game have changed yet, but I have been diving deep into turbo calculations. And uh, first steps were to make dynamically generated or procedurally generated compressor maps and turbine maps. That has been quite the challenge. Uh, but successfully completed. And that is what we're going to take a look at. Uh, spent probably two and a half weeks on staring at that spreadsheet. So let's take a look. All right, so here we are. Uh, starting off with gathering turbo data. That has been done, I believe it was around two years ago already. 
preparing for the turbo revamp, for the eventual turbo revamp that is now happening. And I just went to uh, Garrett's website and pulled out all the turbo data they had on offer and then just ordered them by size. And from that, you can get a lot of information about various progressions, which I just plot and then take a look at to see if there is any kind of correlation in there. And uh, yeah, a, a lot of correlation was found. A little bit of model building was done. But uh, the main decision was then coming from looking at the calculations, which are basically um, you have an input where you have a pressure and you have a temperature and you have a mass flow and the output is a different temperature, a different pressure and the same mass flow. So with that being, uh, being said and part of the calculations, one important parameter in this conversion from pressure and temperature to a new pressure and temperature is the efficiency of the device. And that is true for both the um, compressor side as well as the turbine side. So um, what I did is I ventured forth, uh, I gathered my party to venture forth and uh, created this. It is a complete parameterization of compressor maps and turbine maps. So how does that work or how do you go about this? Well, uh, one thing that is, one feature that is in common for all compressor maps is that there is a surge line, basically the delimiter to where uh, the compressor is able to compress air without getting into weird air fluctuations or pressure fluctuations that basically rip apart the turbo. That is the blue line, the surge line that I have modeled here. And that is kind of ass backwards because uh, this is X and Y uh, just switched. And this one is the correct one to look at. So in a compressor map plot, you would be seeing that this line here of efficiencies there where the cutoff lies, that is the surge line. That is where your compressor no longer can properly compress air. What you have on the y-axis is the pressure ratio, where one, of course, means atmospheric pressure. And then on the x-axis, you have your mass flow in either pounds per minute or kilograms a second, uh, depending on um, where you're from and stuff. So what is the other line here? The main other line, that the main other feature is the choke line. The choke line marks the region where the compressor no longer can compress more air. It's just being choked. It's like you're hammering it with more air and you just can't compress more. And that is the line that you would be seeing here uh, around this edge where you fall off in efficiency. The yellow line in here is my parameterization of the, of, uh, the optimum efficiency line, which has an optimal efficiency point, but in general, it is more like a ridge, an efficiency ridge across the compressor map. So what I've done there is to basically have these three curves and then uh, in X and Y have a fall off from that yellow line towards the blue and the red line. And after two weeks of fiddling with it, out comes this. So if we take a closer look by just changing the scale, I've doubled the scale there and there, that is the pressure and that is my mass flow scale. As you can see here, it has the uh, exactly what you'd expect, the proper efficiency islands, it has the ridges. Usually those compressor maps are going to 60% efficiency. If you look at very old ones, they go down to 50% efficiency of the compressor. And you're peaking around 75 to 80% depending on how good the turbo is and all that stuff. Of course, what you're seeing here is a very low resolution representation of it. But by, when you're zooming in like this with the calculations, by just changing the scale here in the spreadsheet, this 100 times 100 roughly, a little bit more in X, um, scale is enough to already show the shape and basically make the compressor map function. So that bodes really well for um, the calculations in game. I highly doubt that we will be able to visualize this in version 4.2.
because, well, this is a new graph type, basically, we would have to create for that. Um, but I believe that if this is implemented in C++, then it would be fast enough to generate, a, for example, 800 times 600 pixel image, more or less image, well, texture, uh, that has a proper look like this, but with um, a much higher resolution. So if you wanted to go in detail, we could start at... Ah, let me let me just zoom in and show you. All right, here you go. A much zoomed in portion of that same compressor map we have. And you can see the various um, contours of the rounded efficiency levels. Usually in compressor maps, you see those outlined as um, relief maps. And you can see here that we have the... That is, that is where that shroud porting would come in, for those of you who are really into this stuff. But um, yeah, this is the surge line uh, at quite low pressure ratios, yes. And you see that the fidelity is there and it all looks correct. It is just a matter of resolution, which is great. The turbine side of things is a little bit more simple because you can make that into a one-dimensional thing. It is just dependent on the pressure ratio and um, well, it has a certain mass flow tied to it as well though. Um, and that basically gives you an idea of how efficient it is and uh, when you spool. There's more to all that though. There, there's some more tables down here, so let's take a quick look. Um, for this map, you have the, the same scale applies to this one down here. You have a speed map for the compressor. Uh, or, well, for the turbo, because they are linked, of course. The turbine side is linked with the compressor side, and that's why a turbo works. Um, and, oh, you could you could put a slush box in between <laughs> if you really wanted to generate some heat in oil. But, um, yes. So you do have the RPM numbers for the, for the turbo, uh, and this would be the full map, uh, the full efficiency map, if it's not cut by the various limitations. That would be speed, i.e. turbo explodes, um, and the surge limit. But Kerob, that is cool and all, and I'm completely nerded out. But how does the player actually interact with this? Well, glad you asked, because this is actually pretty simple. And it is already made such that uh, at least generating the maps works with just the input parameters that we have in, in plan for you. And that is, well, design year is one input parameter when you design the engine. This overall size slider, here parameterized via the compressor exducer size in millimeters. Then there is the quality of the assembly, uh, so quality slider. And then there's the tune slider. Think of it as the AR ratio slider. The AR ratio slider will no longer just modify the AR ratio, but also the compressor trim. And for those of you who are not turbo experts, which I assume are 99.99% of the people watching, uh, probably nothing of this means anything to you. And that is why we just call it Tune. And you understand it like Tune 80. Yeah, that's really sporty and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it will be in game. So that just means a larger trim, so more breathing on the compressor side and better flow on the turbine side by increasing the AR ratio. The AR ratio and the trim will be shown in tooltips and whatnot so that you actually get a reasonable understanding for what these parameters, how these parameters compare to reality. But um, we don't want to have you interact with those details directly because it's just not necessary. So how about we go and build a modern, uh, let's say high-ish performance turbo and talk about some other things that come out of that. So by modern 2020, looking good, um, how about a 144 mil exducer? And we are running this at uh, a quality of 5 and a tune of 80. And we are using um, ball bearings. And what you instantly see here is that the map has uh, changed a lot. Well, we have a lot more flow, so let me try to get that back into scale. Just change the scale of things, and there we have our little compressor map forming. You can see the numbers here already. The color scheme is being applied. There you go. Um, so we have the surge line cutting it off at reasonably high efficiencies, 
It's something that you don't quite can make use of. But then we have a very, very far reach of actually adding boost to the thing before getting choked out. So running this turbo would be a little interesting because you see this number up there. That's a 5.0 in case you can't tell if you don't have it in super high resolution and squint a bit. Um, 5.0 pressure ratio means 4 bar of boost. So are we going to get rid of the 3 bar boost limit? I think the answer to that will be a yes. That is one of the advantages of making this proper. It takes a lot more time because we don't fake it anymore or not as much uh, with actually having those, those compressor maps and turbine maps. But we can also, we are independent of uh, arbitrary limitations like the three bars. You can run the engine at extremely high, like at Formula One levels of boost, uh, or uh, in the 70s. Uh, this would go up to like five bar, so this would be a six, pressure ratio six. Five bars of boost um, could be possible for the extremely high end turbos. So what if you are in 1970 and want to build your first turbo engine? Maybe you shouldn't aim for something like this. Maybe, maybe let's try, try making one. Whoops. Okay, so this is, <laughs> this is the compressor map at the exact same scale that we were on before. <laughs> no, oh, sorry, this is. <laughs> Hadn't updated. So let's, let's change that a bit so that we can see what actually happens. Ah, yes, look at that. 72% efficiency. Decent setup. This is with a tune of 20, 72 mil um, extusa size. Of course, no ball bearings. 1970, zero quality. This is quite usable. I think you would be able to make some decent-ish turbo engines, if you have fuel injection, of course. Otherwise, you will run into problems. So one of the goals with this, of doing it properly, would also be, and I can't guarantee that it will happen, but um, this is what we're currently aiming for. One of the goals would be to have proper temperature and pressure and mass flow calculations throughout the engine system throughout the, the, um, the engine, from the intake, over the first compressor stage, the, over the second compressor stage, over the intercooler, over to the, um, the combustion chamber, to the exhaust, uh, through the first stage of the turbine, which usually is linked to the second stage directly uh, via a valve or something. Um, and then out the exhaust where you have a certain amount of back pressure and so on. We would be able to get all those values out if things are working as I wish they would. Which usually is getting to about 90% in about 200% of the time that I anticipated. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, that would be the goal. And eventually like for 4.3, when we have a bit more time for more, some more UI, that could be visualized as well in the engine designer, and I think that would blow people's minds. Would they be perfectly accurate? Well, of course not. Would they be reasonable ballpark figures that make sense, that when you change something that should increase temperature, that it will increase temperature? Yes. So I think this will further make the engine designer deeper and more believable and um, especially to those people who are a little bit more invested into the underlying technologies they would sure value that but even the casual player would that it's like oh look I'm playing a game that looks so cool it has all those stats that my little brain does not understand but uh, yeah uh, turbos if you hadn't noticed are quite complicated not in terms of how they function but in terms of how how they interact with everything. <laughs> okay, but I think this should give you a, a decent glimpse at where we are at in terms of the turbo revamp. And currently it is looking like, like this. I'm currently in the stage of actually applying these calculations and get some weird values at the moment. But I'm going to sort that out. Um, understanding corrected flow was another issue for me, but that has been mostly figured out now. Um, so, yeah, um, actual calculations seem to be running, and I hope we can get that all in for the version proper that you're going to play. 
And with that, I think the, this little dev update is done. I hope you enjoyed and see you guys next time. <laughs>